the biometric, uh, the BIPA, I, I forget what it is, um, by Stephen Vance and a few other plaintiffs who sued IBM. I think it's been, this lawsuit's been paused now as a class action suit, not 100% sure. Under Illinois statute, this says, biometrics are unlike unique identifiers that are used to access finances and under sensitive information, and they go on to list a few. But biometrics are biologically unique to the individual, therefore once compromised, the individual has no recourse. Um, so they accuse IBM of taking these unique facial membership, um, uh, measurements of thousands of Illinois uh, citizens in, in flagrant violation of BIPA's requirements and go on to say that um, the defendant IBM uh, uh, is, is, is violating uh, people and subjecting them to increased surveillance, stalking, identity theft, and other invasions of privacy or fraud. I even want to go ahead and promotize this excavating AI article um, that, that Crawford and Paglin said. Um, Crawford and Paglin say in their excavating AI article, there's a, this is certainly not a fix and there are still half a million people's photos there without their knowledge or consent classified in ways that they'd likely reject. Also, deleting this history raises problems of its own as we explain here. But in their own archaeology, who are the people in these data sets and what, predicting, what productive work does excavating these AI uh, data sets perform? So in this piece, Michael Lyons, creator of one of the data sets, talks about the, um, one of the uh, articles they talk about in excavating AI called the Japanese facial, female facial expressions uh, data set was exhibited at art shows in Paris and Milan by Crawford and Paglin and served as a teaser photo on Twitter and other social media, notably without consent of the subjects of the data set. And you can see I'm not showing the subjects of, of the data sets in, in, the, in, this, in this presentation in any kind of identifiable manner. Um, and so Lyons notes that ethical double standard in the work, exhibiting the data set as a means of demonstrating data extraction, but falling short of upsetting their consent in their own practice. And this, I think, is probably the biggest stretch in this talk, but it's sort of thinking, and it, but, but if you bear with me, please, please bear with me. Um, you, you, you're with me 35 minutes in, at least stay with me the last 10 minutes. <laughs> five minutes? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> it's cool, all I have is five minutes. So Everest Pipkin in their work, Lace, in their, in their work, Lace work describes the act of watching a, this data set called Moments in Time, which consists of three second clips of videos which are classified into discrete actions by human annotators. Each video is slowed down, interpolated, and upscaled immediately in imagined detail. The stream of videos is haunting, ghostly. The face is rendered ghastly by the resampling process, but commonplace as we see how poorly AI power generated models seem to do with human features. Pipkin planned on watching only a small percentage of the videos from the data set, but ended up watching all one million three second videos in their entirety. They remark on their hours of watching the violence in these works. In the archive, there are moments of extreme emotion and personal vulnerability, tears, screaming, and pain, moments of questionable consent, including pornography, racist and fascist imagery, animal cruelty and torture, and worse, I saw horrible images. I saw dead bodies. I saw human lives end. And Pipkin taps into the nerve of the matter. Machine learning data sets are a violent archive of faces, actions, moments taken without context. Many of the frames which are available for people to contest being included in this archive are limited. They can't really ask to be removed. Be it informed consent as a scientific mechanism, data subjectivity law within the US and US privacy, uh, U, uh, EU privacy and data protection regulation, or other liberal traditions protecting one's likenesses. And so I think my biggest claim here is that what I'm thinking about in this thought and what I think this book is about is that there is a whole body of cultural labor of data maintenance here. Okay, here I'm riffing a lot from uh, Dylan Mulvin, who is a uh, cultural historian and science and technology scholars, who wrote an amazing book called Proxies. The way that we think about data, data cleaning, data munging, there's a whole host of cultural data, uh, of cultural labor, of, of, of physical labor, uh, of maintaining the illusion that data sets are clean, right? That there are, to pretend that is, there's an ontology that can be sprouting as if by magic from the head of Zeus, 
It just it doesn't it doesn't happen of that nature, right? Data is messy. Data takes work to appear clean. And I think that work is done over and over, when it, whether it's in terms of developing their ontologies, of how they're, lab <laughs> they're, they're labeled, and of the data subjects and the people whose lives are encapsulated in those image data sets. Uh, with that, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> So thank you very much, Alex. That was a wonderful talk. And you're wonderful. And um, so we have barely five minutes for questions. Um, who wants to start? And I can also, if folks wants to, want to ask something in, Engl in Spanish, I can also translate. I can offer that. Um, yeah, who wants to who has a question? Yes. Hello there. So let's suppose that we have to build a new data set from scratch. It's not going to be easy, you know. And you're in charge of this. How can, <laughs> how can we do it in a sustainable way, in a proper way? It's tough, I know. I said I don't want to propose any solutions. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I always want to refuse to answer the question, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will not. I will not do that. I will. I will. Um, why are you collecting the data? I just want to ask that. Why are you collecting it? That's my first question, and it's probably going to be my only answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyone else questions? I promise Alex will answer that one. I'll answer it. Sorry. <laughs> Don't expect me to give you any guidance. If you want to like write a like a our pipeline or something, I don't ask someone else. Yeah, Shani. Thank you for the talk, amazing. How we as a community can help to keep accountable to the industry that is creating this and misusing this. I know you don't promise solution. No, but no, it's good. I mean, there's a lot of things here, right? I mean, there's, I mean, one of the things that this is a call for is an understanding of where data come from and an ask for data histories. Um, Dylan, in early in this talk, talked about data sheets and data documentation. I would say that we need to go, I think data sheets as an artifact are a start, and data sheets are a means of being reflexive. And so understanding where these things come from and what histories they belie is, I think, critical. That's a question on kind of self-practice. Holding other people to account, I think, is much harder, right? That has to do much more in the, in the realm of regulation and policy and whatnot. But those are tools that could be acted upon to hold big players accountable. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions. Anyone? Yes. Well, thank you for the talk. Um, I always get so frustrated because ImageNet keeps getting used and um, nobody really holds anyone accountable the incentive structure as well. Uh, benchmarks are like the vein of getting signed, but academic acceptance. Um, so as much as we publish papers about how ImageNet and all are terrible, how do we still go to conferences who celebrate the people who submit um, and use these terrible data sets? How do we still do that? Oh gosh, I mean that's your, what your dissertation is about, right? Sir? Such a <laughs> <laughs> how we're gonna solve this? Yeah, um, I mean it's it's about in incentives, right? I mean there's a problem that there is some um, what is it called? Not necessarily a Matthew effect, but like there's sort of a thing where it's so entrenched to use a certain kind of thing as a benchmark, right? 
And so it seems like there needs to be more moves to moving away from benchmarking as a practice to other types of analysis. The problem is that more and more, especially with like chat GPT there, the benchmarks even are not even stable. They seem to keep on moving, right? And so what are ways to make alternative kinds of modes of evaluation? Um, we can kind of propose that and we can try to find alternative venues, but I mean, we also have to look at the sort of political economy of what it means to win a benchmark. And, you know, Sutzgever and Hinton went off to find fame, but so did Matt um, Zeiler went on to find Clarify and, you know, people winning these competitions and say they can beat soda on whatever, get millions and millions of dollars, right? So it becomes not only a question of scientific integrity, be, but it becomes a question of political economy and it allocation of who gets what. So I think that is a problem. Um, and that's going to take a lot more inquiry than just intervening on scientific grounds. Okay, unless there's a very short question that requires a very short answer. Yes. Do you have a working title for the book? Oh, gosh. No, I'm really bad at titles. Um, um, what? I said, fuck ImageNet. <laughs> yeah, fuck ImageNet. Um, <laughs> it, could be, it could be abolish ImageNet, or it could be, you know, ImageNets of X or something. I don't know. Yeah, I said, someone, if you want to talk a title, I don't know. I'm sure you're, you're better at this, Daniel. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Then thank you very much, Dr. Alexana.